message. If you don't feel your need of a savior, then his life and his death will hold no value to you and you will not be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ who God loves humanity and does not want that any should perish. He wants them to understand what it cost God to redeem them. But if they don't really see their need of a savior, then uh, they miss the point completely. So uh, I haven't introduced myself yet. My name is Keith Thomas. I'm an ex-commercial fisherman from England. And uh, the Lord uh, called me from my nets many years ago and told me he wanted me to work on his nets. So his gospel net, uh, we're trying to do what we can with the gifts and talents that God has given us. And our goal is to... Uh, focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and promote his gospel, his good news. Gospel means good news to the world as a whole. So our title, topic for tonight is, Why Did Jesus Have to Die? Uh, that is a good question. Because many people, I think, uh, they understand that Jesus died, but why did he have to die? So that's our goal for tonight, trying to understand the reason why Jesus had to die. The Apostle Peter had something very interesting to say on the day of Pentecost, that powerful day when the Spirit of God came in power and 3,000 uh, precious people were saved that one day. And he got up and he preached the gospel, and uh, we won't go into the whole words, but there was one sentence in his message where he explained that it was, these are the words as it says in Acts 2 verse 23, he was delivered, he being the Lord Jesus, he was delivered up by God's set plan and foreknowledge. Did you ever reflect on that? that God's set plan was fixed before humanity even came to be on planet Earth. His foreknowledge planned out the visit of the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was to come. So all people need to have this truth of the reason why he had to come. And uh, did you know that there are 320 prophecies in the Old Testament that spoke about the coming of the Lord. Not only to live, but to die. 320 prophecies that's staggering uh, that he fulfilled in great detail. Many that he, as we said last time, uh, that he could not have uh, moved and manipulated them to fulfill them by himself. They were all seen and prepared and planned. God sees everything all at one time. There's nothing that surprises him. He doesn't wake up one morning and say, Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> no, he knows everything sees everyone, he knows every thought that we think, he knows every desire within our hearts, he knows the hairs on our heads, he knows when we sit down and stand up again. He knows everything, he has complete knowledge of all the facts of everyone on earth. So these prophecies spoke of his life and death as the pivotal event in human history. Someone pointed out that history is all his story. And, uh, and as we look back and we look at all the events of history, it's all going to culminate in his coming. But before that, his plan is to redeem as many people that say yes to walking with him and following him in his, uh, in his life, the life that he gives. 
for us. In his story, Christ's death and resurrection at the very heart of all that's been going on since the beginning of time. What Jesus accomplished on the cross was the whole purpose of his coming. And if you miss the reason for his death, you've missed the entire point. There's this story of uh, the British evangelist, J. John. He tells the story of, uh, of a man walking his dog to the lake one day. And he picks up a, a stick by the edge of the lake and he throws it into the lake and his dog goes after the stick running on the top of the water. And he's absolutely blown away by that. And the dog gets his stick and comes back to his master and, and the guy says, I don't believe this. This is not possible. What a dog I have. So he thinks, I've got to go worldwide with this dog. I'll start with my neighbor just to make sure that uh, I've got a strong witness of what my dog can do. So the next day, he doesn't tell his neighbor what he's going to do, so he brings his neighbor and he says, uh, he picks up the stick again and he throws it into the water and again his dog runs on the water, picks up the stick and brings it back to him. And the guy says to his neighbor, he says, did you notice anything unusual about my dog? The neighbor says, I did, I did. The man says, well, what did you notice? And the neighbor says, your dog can't swim. <laughs> what? <laughs> your dog can't swim? You know, many people are like that neighbor. The gospel is in front of them, but they miss the point. They miss the crux of the story, and if we miss the reason for the cross then we miss the reason for our hope. Why do people wear a cross? Let's talk about that. I'm sure as you've uh, walked around, you've seen people wearing a cross around their necks. Have you ever stopped to think about why they're wearing a cross? For instance, it'd be kind of unusual to, for, for a person to wear a model of a guillotine around their neck, wouldn't it? You'd, kind of look twice at such a thing. Or maybe even an electric chair. Somebody walking around with an electric chair around their neck, you'd think, what on earth is that guy up to? But how often do we come across people with a cross around the neck in the Western world? We don't think anything of it. Many of them don't even believe in Jesus, but like to wear a cross. We are so used to seeing the cross around people's necks that we don't even think that the cross is a symbol of torture. And, uh, and it's one of the cruelest ways of execution ever to be seen on, on the earth. And in fact, the Romans, not known for their human rights, abolished crucifixion in AD 337, considering it too inhumane. Can you believe that? The cross has always been regarded as the symbol of the Christian faith. And a high proportion of the gospel message is all about the death of Christ. Much of the New Testament is concerned about explaining what happened at the cross. In fact, when the Apostle Paul corresponded with the Corinthian church, he wrote these words, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's quite a statement. I mean, say Jesus led such an exemplary life, but when Paul is preaching uh, in Corinth, he, he wanted to emphasize more than anything the death of Christ rather than the life of Christ. So, it was so important that that was all he wanted to talk about. And when we think of important people that have, that have walked this earth, uh, we think of maybe Winston Churchill, Rosa Parks, Ronald Reagan, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King. But when we think, we, we think of what they did in their lives and how they influenced society, 
But uh, when we read the New Testament, quite a large proportion of the Gospels is all focused on the death of Jesus. Why? What is the difference between his death and so many other historical people throughout uh, history? So unless we see what Jesus' death saved us from, the power of sin and death, we will not understand the significance of the cross. Hmm. So let's understand, first of all, our being alienated from God by what the Bible calls sin. What, what is this sin? We, not so many people use it, that word today. So let's try and understand what sin is, first of all. If you were to ask people whether they'll be okay at the judgment bar of God, most of them would respond yes. And behind that judgment is the thought that they're comparing themselves to other people. And they say, well, compared with this person and that person, yeah, I think I'll be okay. And... Uh, I remember speaking many years ago to a young man and uh, talked to him about the Lord Jesus. And I, I asked him that question. Well, when you stand before God, will you be okay? What do you think? What do you think will happen to you when you stand before God and are and brought into judgment? And he said, well, I'll be okay, he said. I said, well, Why? He said, well, there was a plane crash near me and I ran to the plane and I helped them get out. And because of that, I think God will see me okay in the judgment because I did some good work. And uh, when I asked him what he would do about his sin, he flat out to my face said, well, I've never sinned. And he was deceived into thinking that his moral standing was better than most, and because he judged that his life was better than most, he felt that he would be okay on the day of judgment. He compared his life to others and said that he didn't really feel his need of a savior. And that's what I want to do in the first part of this message. If you don't feel your need of a savior, then his life and his death will hold no value to you and you will not be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ, who God loves humanity and does not want that any should perish. He wants them to understand what it cost God to redeem them. But if they don't really see their need of a Savior, then they miss the point completely. Let's think of our standing before God as represented by a bank account. In this account, we have positives and negatives, payments and withdrawals. The problem is that we are all morally in debt. The standard to attain for our spiritual bank account is for us, for us to go to heaven when we die. The bar is perfection. And we said, well, none of us are perfect. That is the point, brothers and sisters. None of us are perfect. We all have need of a savior. The Lord Jesus is the standard for us to reach. And none of us have credit in our righteousness bank account. We are all in the negative. So who can we turn to? We can't turn to someone else that's, that's in debt. <laughs> They're not going to help us with our righteousness bank account. They're already in debt. In fact, the whole human race is in debt, morally in debt to this holy God whom we must give account to. And our debt in this scenario can be best described as things that we know to be wrong, things that the Ten Commandments show us that we have not done and have committed lies, stealing, pride, the taking of God's name in vain, etc., etc. 
words and actions we wish we could take back, but it's too late. One sin bars us from heaven, which is a perfect place. And sinners can't attain to a perfect place because we are imperfect. We need an input of divine righteousness into our spiritual bank account. Paul the Apostle talks about it in these words. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Living Bible puts it a little bit different. Living Bible, for all of us have fallen short uh, of God's of God's standard. The Lord Jesus Christ is the standard. Let's talk of it in this way. Have you ever found it difficult to apologize? We, we all are, are like that, you know. We all find it difficult to say, I was wrong. <laughs> I have sinned and please forgive me. Those words are difficult. And it's our human pride that's involved. Uh, very few of us find it easy to say, please accept my apologies. We avoid those words like anything. So why is it so hard to admit that we have wrong, we have done wrong? We find it hard to admit to God that we've done wrong. And people excuse themselves uh, for their moral failures. They try to avoid it. Well, I've never sinned. But the problem is that all of us have sinned and there is none that uh, have attained to God's perfect standard of righteousness. So, let me ask you a question, give you a chance to uh, think about these things. What are some of the consequences of, li of walking a life in opposition to God's right path. Think of the Ten Commandments. What, what are some of the consequences uh, of uh, not walking in, in obedience to God's commandments? Give you a few minutes to think on that. What are some of the consequences of sin? So we're hoping <clears throat> to really understand what sin is to a holy God. Because the more we can understand how sin offends God, uh, the more we can appreciate what God, the lengths that God has gone to, to put us right from our sin. So, what does this scripture say? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It says that none of us have met the standard. What's the standard? The standard is the glory of God, or li the Living Bible puts it, God's standard. Uh, all of us have fallen short of God's ideal for living, the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. None of us have met the standard of God's righteousness. In fact, the Greek word, uh, that's uh, translated into the English word sin is harmatia, and it was an archery term in New Testament times. And, and you, when you fire an arrow at a target, if you fail to hit the bullseye, it was fallen short, harmatia, sin. Sin means to fall short of the bullseye. And when we think of the bullseye being the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we all fall short of that standard, right? <laughs> None of us are good enough, good enough. We have all fallen short. And it doesn't matter whether you're better than that person or better than this person. Uh, we have all fallen short of God's glorious ideal for living, the Lord Jesus Christ. Somerset Maugham once said, if I wrote down every thought I have ever thought and every deed I have ever done, men would call me a monster of depravity. The essence of sin is a rebellion against God, Genesis 3, resulting in us being cut off from him, 
It's like the prodigal son being separated from his father. Some would say, if we're all in the same boat, how does it matter? Does, does it matter? The answer is that yes, it does matter because of the consequences of sin in our lives, which can be summarized under four headings. Number one, the pollution of sin. Number two, the power of sin. Number three, the penalty of sin. And number four, the partition of sin. So let's look at the first one, what Jesus said about the pollution of sin. Verse 20, I'm reading from Mark 7, verse 20 to 23. He went on. What comes out of a man makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. So you may say, oh, I, don't, I do not do most of those things. But one of them alone is enough to mess up our lives. We may, we may wish the Ten Commandments was like an examination paper. Just, just uh, attempt any three of the ten. <laughs> but the New Testament says if we break any part of the law, we are guilty of breaking all of it, James 2 verse 10 says. One sin is enough to pollute your life and disbar you from the perfection of heaven. For instance, I'll give you an analogy. There's a person that bought himself a really lovely sports car, and he thought, well, I better get it insured. So he went to his insurance agent. So the insurance agent started reading off a few questions as to how much it would cost him and what his coverage would be like. And one of the first questions he asked him, well, do you have a clean license? And the man responded, well, my license is reasonably clean. And you see, how can you have a reasonably clean license? It's either messed up or it's clean. Which is it? And the guy had to admit, yeah, he had some problems before with his driving. One traffic infringement means that you've broken the law. So it is with us. One offense makes our life unclean. For instance... How many murders does one have to commit before they become a murderer? One, right? How many lies does a person have to tell before they become a liar? One. How many sins does a person have to commit before they become a sinner in need of the grace and mercy of God? Again, the answer is one. One offense makes our life unclean and gives us a need for the righteousness bank account to, uh, to be deposited. We have need of the righteousness of God, the forgiveness of God. Let's talk about number two, the power of sin. Jesus replied, John 8, verse 34, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. What do you mean, Jesus? The things that we do wrong have an addictive power over us. We all know, perhaps in our friends, uh, an alcoholic that can't break their addiction to drink. Uh, I think of myself. Before I became a Christian, I, I smoked a lot of pot, marijuana, cannabis. And, uh, and it got a hold on me. And I tried it again and again to get rid of my illegal drugs. And I eventually went to prison for six months for smoking marijuana. The, 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 the law that I broke was allowing my premises to be used for the smoking of cannabis. Can you believe that? 
That was a long while ago, <laughs> obviously, be before I met the Lord Jesus Christ and was delivered. But I knew that I was doing wrong. I knew that I was breaking the law. And there were times when I literally could not look at myself in the mirror. I hated being a pot smoker. I didn't want to grow up to be a pot smoker, but it had a hold of me. And I remember taking my marijuana, my cannabis, and throwing it into the sea one day. The very next day, I was back there again buying some more because it had an, a hold on me, and sin is like that. No matter what it is, whether it's lying, whether it's deception, whether it's lust, whether it's... You, you, it, once it has its hold on you, it's going to not let you go. And only when I came to the Lord Jesus Christ and abandoned my life into his hands and asked him to forgive me of my sin was that power of that addictive nature of sin broken from me. So whether it's bad temper, whether it's envy, whether it's arrogance, pride, selfishness, all of us have different things that have managed to get a grip on us. And only the Lord Jesus, I found, was able to break the addiction to, uh, to drugs that I have. This had, this is the slavery that Jesus talks about. The things we do and the sins we involve ourselves with have a power over us that makes us slaves to them. Bishop J.C. Ryle, a former bishop of Liverpool, once wrote these words, Each and all sins have crowds of unhappy prisoners bound hand and foot in their chains. The wretched prisoners sometimes boast that they are eminently free, but there is no slavery like this. Sin is indeed the hardest of all taskmasters. Misery and disappointment on the way, despair and hell in the end, are the only wages that sin pays its servants, which leads us to the third consequence, <clears throat> the penalty for sin. The scripture, Paul wrote, Romans 6.23 the wages of sin is death. I don't know about you, but one of the things that moves me often to prayer is the news. When I see things on the news, it moves me, and I think, oh, God, please move in that situation. When I hear of a parent uh, who, who deliberately abuses their children, I, I want justice. Oh, God, give us justice. Put put to flight some of the pain that people go through. And when I'm in a traffic jam, and maybe you've been there, and you're patiently slowly going up to whatever is causing the jam, you see one bright spark flying past you, doing 50 mile an hour, and you, and you I don't know about you, but I think, God, stop them. Let them be caught. But all of a sudden, there comes a time when... I'm late for a meeting, and guess what? <laughs> I, then I don't want justice. I want grace and mercy, right? If, I, if I'm ever to do such a thing, you know, speeding up the edge because I'm late for an appointment, uh, we, then we want grace and we want mercy. And I want the policeman who stops me to let me off. <laughs> I don't want justice. I don't want to have to pay that kind of fine. Can you relate to this? Why is it that things look totally different from our own vantage point? We, we are right to feel that sin should be punished and the laws guide us to live our lives correctly. People who sin should be punished for their sins. And just as our weekly work deserves a salary, a wage. Our sin earns us a wage at the end of our lives. The consequences is payable, not only in this life, but at death too. Our employer will pay us what we deserve 
by what we have done, our wage. In the same way, God, in his justice, must give us the payment we earn with our lives of sin, which is separation from God for eternity, a state that the Bible calls hell. Now stick with me, we're getting to the good part. The wages of sin is death. We have to understand what sin is before we can understand God's plan to overcome it. Let's talk now about the partition of sin, our fourth consequence. Isaiah 59 verse 1 writes, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. When Paul wrote of the wages of sin being death, the death he speaks of is not just physical. We, we all understand that death will come. He, but he's talking about death as spiritual. It is a spiritual death that results in eternal isolation from God. Each of us have felt distant from God due to our sins, but this will also be our reality when we pass from this earth unless we have a deposit of the righteousness of God into our spiritual bank account. We are given this lifetime to make a choice to stay in our sin and suffer the consequences of it, pay the consequences ourselves, or to turn to the Lord Jesus who has paid the debt of our sin. The scriptures tell us that there is an accounting at the end of our lives on earth. Here's what Hebrews 9 verse 27 tells us. It is appointed for man to die once, and after that, comes judgment. So let's talk about the solution after painstakingly looking clearly at what sin does to us. Let's look at the solution. We all need a savior to deliver us from the consequences of the sin of our lives. The Lord Chancellor in England, Lord Mackay of Clashfern, wrote these words. The central theme of our faith is the sacrifice of himself by our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins. The deeper our appreciation of our own need, the greater will be our love for the Lord Jesus and therefore the more fervent our desire to serve him. The good news of Christianity is that God has seen our predicament and taken steps to resolve the problem. His, his solution was to come himself as a substitute to pay our debt of sin. Our sin earned death, but Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, has come to pay the price John Stott, author of many books, calls this act of God stepping in to be the substitution. He calls it the self-substitution of God. Here's what the scripture says. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. He himself, the he being God, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So let's, let's look at that a little bit closer. Number one, the self-substitution of God. What does self-substitution mean? In his book, Miracle on the River Kwai, Ernest Gordon tells the true story of a group of prisoners of war working on the Burma Railway during the Second World War. The tools were collected by the work party at the end of their work day each day. On one occasion, a Japanese guard shouted that a shovel was missing and demanded to know 
which man has taken it? He began to rant and rave and thought that he would be uh, brought into trouble by his commanding officer if they weren't all found. So he started to take it out on the soldiers. Which one of you took it? And he was getting caught up into a frenzy and, and at one point he pointed his rifle at, the, at the, the work party and said, all die, all die. At that moment, one man stepped forward and the guard clubbed him to death with his gun while he stood silently to attention. He just took it all, knowing that he would die for that very thing. When they returned to the camp, the tools were counted again, and no shovel was missing. He miscounted. That man went forward as a substitute for the others. He took the death penalty himself and satisfied justice. He, Jesus, satisfied justice for all of us. All die, all die. Jesus said, no, Father, let, I will go and I will pay the substitution price of death for them. Number two, the agony of the cross. Jesus was our substitute he endured crucifixion for us. Cicero described crucifixion as the cruelest and hideous of tortures. Jesus was stripped, tied to a whipping post, and flogged with four or five thongs of leather interwoven with sharp, jagged bone that tore his back apart. And, uh, and many people, their bones were showing after they had uh, had their way uh, with them. The sufferer's veins, Eusebius, the third, third century church historian, wrote, the sufferer's veins were laid bare and the very muscles, sinews, and bowels of the victim were open to exposure. He was then taken, the Lord Jesus was then taken to the praetorium, the Roman courtyard inside the fortification, where a crown of thorns was thrust onto his head. He was then mocked by 600 men and hit about the face and head, then forced to carry a heavy crossbar on his bleeding soldiers until he collapsed. Simon of Cyrene was enlisted to carry it for him. When they reached the crucifixion site, he was again stripped naked, laid on the cross, and six-inch nails driven into his forearms just above the wrist. His knees were twisted sideways so that the ankles could be nailed between the tibia and the Achilles tendon. He was lifted on the cross, which was then dropped into a socket in the ground. Jesus was left to hang in intense heat, unbearable thirst, exposed to the crowd's ridicule. He hung there in unimaginable pain for six hours, nine o'clock in the morning till three in the afternoon. And while his life slowly drained away, the worst part, though, was not the physical trauma, nor even the emotional pain of being rejected by his people, but the spiritual agony of being separated from the Father for us as he carried our sins. And of course, the last word that he spoke, uh, he shouted victoriously from the cross, it is finished, tetelestai in the Greek, meaning paid in full. It was a victory shout that echoed from the cross. He paid our debt. He gave us a deposit of full and complete righteousness that only God can give. Christ has taken all and more than many of us deserved upon himself. He died as a substitute for us. John 3.16, which we all know very clearly. 
For God so loved the world, put your own name in there, in, those, in that place of the world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The result, let's talk about the result. When Adam and Eve gave in to the serpent in the Garden of Eden, they chose to obey Satan, the serpent, uh, rather than God. God warned them in the garden that the day they ate of the fruit, he warned them about the fruit. And he warned that if they were to eat the fruit, it would mean death. And of course, Adam and Eve, when they uh, ate the fruit, what was the first consequence of eating the fruit? They hid from God. Sin causes alienation from God. And uh, they didn't die right away, but death began in them. And of course, Adam lived to over 700 years of age. Can't remember exactly right now. But uh, this separation from God reigned over all humanity from that point. Adam and Eve, their bent of sin came down to each of us. And from that point, Satan legally owned everyone that came into the world and sinned. If there was one sin, legally, he, uh, he, he owned each of us. This separation from God reigned over all humanity, giving Satan the power of death over all humankind. This is why Jesus had to be born of a virgin and remain completely free from sin so that as an innocent substitute, he could pay the penalty for us. Here's what the scripture says, Hebrews 2. Verse 14, since the children have flesh and blood, he too, the Lord Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death, don't miss that, so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. The devil had the power of death over all humanity until the cross. Jesus didn't die the death of a martyr, but he made a legal transaction before the courts of heaven. As God made flesh, his substitutionary death on the cross gave him the legal right to purchase us out of Satan's slave market of sin. Paul Bilheimer in his book, and I really recommend this one, Paul Bilheimer, Destined for the Throne, a great book. It's one of those books that I've read several times and I've given it away and then I want it again because it's so profound, the truth, that I go and buy it again. Because a book like that never comes back because people give good books away to their friends. But I've had this book three times now, and I still have got a copy now. <laughs> I don't give it out that easy, but it's destined for the throne. And in his book, he writes this, and I quote, When the results of Calvary are adequately appraised, it appears for what it is, the triumph of the ages. When Jesus died without failing in the smallest detail, his death resulted not only in defeating Satan's purpose to obtain a claim on him, it also cancelled all of Satan's legal claims upon the earth and the whole human race. Under universal jurisprudence, when a man commits murder, he becomes subject to the death penalty. 
A convicted murderer forfeits his own life. He destroys himself. When Satan secured the death of Jesus, he became, for the first time in his age-long history, a murderer. He who had the, quote, the power of death had slain his millions with impunity since the fall of Adam because he had a legal right to do so. As a slave owner, Satan had legal title to Adam and his offspring. He could do with them what he chose. But he who, quote, had the power of death and had exercised it on countless millions with complete immunity, now committed the most colossal blunder of all his diabolical career. He brought him upon himself the sentence of death. The scriptures give us four images to describe what Jesus did for us at the cross. Let me read a portion of Scripture, and then we'll go back and explain four different parts of this passage of Scripture. The the passage is found in Romans 3, verses 21 to 26. Let me read. But now a righteousness from God, there's that divine deposit that I mentioned, now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now, kind of long portion of scripture, so let's go four sentences. The first one. The first image is from the temple. We're explaining the solution and the result of what happened at the cross. The first image is from the temple. Romans 3, verse 25. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Now, in the Old Testament, there were certain laws that were laid down to deal with sin, a whole system of sacrifices, demonstrating to the Jewish people and to us the seriousness of sin and the need for cleansing from it. In a typical case, the sinner would take an animal, and the animal was to be as near perfect as possible. The man would lay his hand on the lamb and speak his sin over it so that the sin would be carried over to the sacrificial animal. Thus the sins were seen to pass from the sinner to the animal, which would then be killed This sacrificial death was a picture to us all that sin meant death. And the only way out was the death of a substitute. God was showing to them through analogy, picture language, what he was going to do in the future, which for us nowadays is in the past. God has completed that sacrifice of the perfect lamb of God for us. This picture was made clear when John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming towards him to be baptized, he shouted out, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. 
Number two, the second image is from the marketplace where it says these words, Romans 3, verse 24, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption. Notice those words. I've got it underlined in your notes. Through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. What do we mean by redemption? We don't use that word so much nowadays. What does it mean? Debt is not a problem confined to our present day. It was a problem in the ancient world. And if someone had serious debts, their only recourse was to be sold into slavery for their debt. So suppose a friend went to the market one day there in Jerusalem, just as he was being sold, and he found out the price that his friend was being sold for, and he paid his debt and let him go free, he would be redeeming him. That is what redemption means. To redeem is to buy out of, to buy back. Similarly, Jesus paid the redemption fee to buy us out of Satan's slave market of sin. The third image. Let's look at the third image. The third image is from the law court. Paul writes, we are justified freely by his grace. Paul uses the term justified freely. The word justification is a legal term. If you went to court and were acquitted, you were justified There's the story of two men that went to school and university together and they developed a close friendship. And life went on and they they separated and went their different ways. One became a judge and one became uh, a thief. And he was caught and brought before the legal system and when he was brought, brought before the judge... They recognized one another and the judge recognized him and realized he had to, he, his friend standing in the dock had to pay the price for his sin. He couldn't just, he couldn't just cancel it out. Uh, he had to give him the legally uh, accepted uh, penalty that his friend had deserved. But he recognized him and he he couldn't let him off. So he told his friend that he would punish him with the correct penalty for the offense. That is justice. Then, coming down from his position as a judge, he took out his checkbook, paid the fine himself. That is love. That is what God has done for us. He couldn't just wink his eye and say, oh, Keith Thomas, you're not too bad. I'll let you off. No, no, he realized, I realized that I had legally stood before the bar of heaven and I fell short. I needed a deposit of righteousness and God loved me so much. He came down from his, uh, his judgeship and paid the fine of death that I deserved. In his justice, he judges us because we are guilty, but in his love, he came down in the person of his son and paid the penalty. Now, that illustration is not an exact one for three reasons. First of all, our plight is much worse The penalty we face is not just a fine, but death. And not just physical death, as I said, but spiritual death. If this goes on and and justice is not met and grace is not given, then we face the consequences of our own self, our own sin, ourself, which is an eternity apart from God. Secondly, the relationship is closer. This is not just friends. This is our Father in heaven who loves us much more than an earthly parent loves his child. 
And third, the cost was higher. It cost God not money, not silver and gold, but his own son. Imagine the father watching Christ hanging on the cross there and meeting out full justice upon him as he bore the consequences of our sin upon himself. It is not an innocent third party, but God himself who saves us. Number four. The fourth image is from the home. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says these words, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not counting men's sins against them. Now, I don't know about you, but that gives me such a, such a joy that God, on behalf of Christ, is not counting my sins against me. What happened to the prodigal son can happen to all of us. He wandered off and away from his father, and his father was daily looking out for him. And his son, as soon as his son made, made a decision to go towards his father, you know it's the, in the parable, uh, his father was there right away, ready to receive him. So, will you accept his free pardon? I ask that of you online. He offers a completely free pardon to us if we will grant, if we will turn to him, turn from sin, and give our lives to him. In 1829, a Philadelphia man named George Wilson robbed the U.S. mail service, killing someone in the process. Wilson was arrested and brought to trial, found guilty, and sentenced to be hanged. Some friends intervened on his behalf and finally obtained a pardon for him from President Andrew Jackson. True story. But when he was informed of this, George Wilson refused to accept the pardon. <laughs> The sheriff was unwilling to enact the sentence, for how could he hang a pardoned man? An appeal was sent to President Jackson. The perplexed president turned to the United States Supreme Court to decide the case. Chief Justice Marshall ruled that a pardon is a piece of paper, the value of which depends on its acceptance by the person implicated. It is hard to suppose that a person under the sentence of death would refuse to accept a free pardon. But if it is rejected, it is then not a pardon. George Wilson must be hanged, the Supreme Court ruled. So, George Wilson was executed, even though his pardon lay on the sheriff's desk. I ask you, those of you online, will you accept this free pardon that God offers you? He has paid the complete debt for all of your sins. You can stand before this holy God and be invited into his presence because of what Jesus Christ has done. It requires repentance. Repentance doesn't mean just so being sorry for your sin. It means turning and walking God's way, doing, put an end to your transgressions, your sins, and, and, and humility of heart, saying to him with sincerity, Oh God, forgive me, a sinner. Walk with me, Lord. I, I want to be new. It's not so much about the words you say, but your heart cry and being willing. There has to be a willingness. It's not just words. Being willing to say and to walk with him. So would you like to do that today? I, I speak to all of you 
that are listening on the video. Today is your opportunity. The God of heaven invites you to come on the basis of this free pardon that he offers you. It's up to you today. Would you stand with me? And those of you that uh, agree with God as to your sin today, will you accept the pardon that he offers you? Here's the prayer. Heavenly Father, I am sorry for what I've done wrong in my life. I, I have sinned. I have done what is wrong in your sight, but I'm so thankful, Father, for these good words uh, of how you have intervened in history and paid the full price uh, for my debt of sin that I owe. Oh, God, I turn to you today. Would you forgive me my sin? I want to walk a, a new life with you. I receive you today, Lord Jesus, into my life. Save me, a sinner. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you next week where we'll go further on these beginnings and foundations for faith.